Thanks very much, uh, Ariel, and uh, welcome to everybody. I'm Andrew Berman. I'm the Executive Director of the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. Of course, sitting to my left is uh, Carol Teller, the subject of tonight's program. Let me just uh, read kind of a, a, a brief introduction. Many, for many of you, this is uh, information you, you know very well, but for some, there may offer some new or interesting insights. Carol Teller is an artist born and raised in Brooklyn who's lived in the East Village since the early 1960s. She lives in the Mitchell Lama development uh, known as Village View Houses on the corner of 4th Street and 1st Avenue. By the way, I grew up in a Mitchell Lama development up in the Bronx, so it's one of the many bonds that um, Carol and I share. We're also, we're also both outer borough kids originally. Um, uh, so uh, where Carol lives is in the middle of what she has referred to as a slum which no one wanted to live in when she moved there. Um, but which was conveniently located to her work at the time and provided a stunning view of Manhattan from her 18th floor apartment. Um, and I've seen it, I can attest to that, and we'll actually all see it tonight as well. Um, Carol worked as an art teacher, beginning her career in Bedford-Stuyvesant and eventually finishing on Governor's Island. After retiring from full-time teaching, Carol took on a part-time art teacher role at PS41 in Greenwich Village. It was after her full-time teaching career ended that Carol really began focusing on her own work. Many of Carol's paintings are sourced from the photos she's taken over the years, preferring to work from a photograph rather than sitting and sketching. She's a fan of representational work, and she owes the Salamagundi Club for helping to encourage her life as an artist. And as Carol said, and this is a quote, I went to Pratt where I learned to be an abstract expressionist but it really wasn't my nature. The Sal Magundi Club allowed me to have my true nature come out, which was representational art. I like to tell stories just like I like to photograph and document life. I don't see abstract things, I see actual things. Uh, and as many of you know, Carol's currently a painter affiliated with Gallery 71, and of course with the Sal Magundi Club where she exhibits her paintings of New York City. So I want to say a few things about um, this collection and, and how this came about. And, and by the way, just to add to what Ariel mentioned before, you'll, you'll see one of the pieces of literature we have is actually about our historic image archive, which Carol has not just generally generously donated to, but kind of put it on the map, so to speak, um, with this incredible collection of, of photos. We had had uh, a non-digital archive for some time. We had recently digitized it, made it available to the public online, and there was definitely some interest in it, with some wonderful photographs and images that we'd had for years. And then Carol came along, who we'd all known for a long time. She was a, a longtime member, came to programs, supported the work that, that we did. And I think it was about a year or so ago, Carol mentioned to somebody on staff, Hey, you know, I've got all these old photos sitting around. You know, you might be interested in, in one or two of them. Um, typically modest, Carol fashion. Um, and she uh, brought some of them in, and we were literally floored. Um, it was such a stunning array of incredibly powerful images of New York over the last 50 years, captured in ways big and small um, with just incredible um, pathos and just poignant, touching moments, scenes that were familiar and yet so distant because when you saw them, you remembered that you used to see this but that you hadn't seen it in years. Um, it was really just such a wonderful window backwards. Um, and we were so amazed at the, both the skill with which Carol captured this on film but also the way in which she seemed to be kind of so prescient in uh, selecting her sites. She seemed to kind of almost know that something wasn't necessarily gonna look like this for that much longer, and I better capture it on film. So uh, this began a process for us, which was really uh, just a labor of love, of taking all of these pictures, and for a variety of reasons, we really wanted to be able to, as often as possible, identify the exact locations. Um, and this, uh, you know, was sometimes this kind of wonderful process of saying, I, I recognize that, I think I can find that, etc." Other times it was this sort of exasperating delight where it would just 
eat at us, saying, I know that, I've walked past that a million times, but uh, you know, I haven't seen it in 10 or 15 or 20 or more years, probably because it's not there anymore. How can I figure out where it is? And it was this sort of wonderful, kind of almost treasure hunt uh, that we went on. Um, that's the sort of short story. As we go through the pictures, we'll probably get into some kind of greater detail on some of that. But I just want to say that when we then did finally put together the first batch, we released this batch of 104 photos um, this past summer, and we called it Carol Teller's Changing New York, and we released it, and we said, we know there's going to be interest in this. We, we love it, and we, we're not going to be alone in that. Um, to say that it set off a, a firestorm of, of interest would be an understatement. Just a few of the uh, outlets out there that picked it up and carried um, news of the release of this collection, Lonely Planet, the UK Daily Mail, NBC, Time Out New York, Gothamist, the dearly departed Gothamist, Curved, the Word Journal, the World Journal, a Chinese language paper, um, Untapped Cities, and literally dozens and dozens of other sites. So this uh, little historic image archive that we had that definitely had a following suddenly was getting thousands and thousands of views every day because of Carol's images and because of the um, interest that they generated. So it brought tens of thousands of people to our website and engaged them with the history of New York, the work that we do, um, and this was just so wonderful. And then another kind of bounty that came of it I just sort of want to show you. So uh, this is just the front page of our historic image archive here. The way it's arranged, and by the way, we now have a, a part two of Carol Teller's, uh, which we're not even going to get into tonight because it, it's, it's new, um, it's as rich as the first part, and it would take another several hours to sort of talk about it and go through it, but everything on here is in sort of a reverse chronological order. So the stuff towards the top is most recently added. So carols we added over the summer, uh, let's see, here it is, over here. Each one of these that are above it was added later, and with a few exceptions, every single one of them was somebody who heard about our archive because of the Carol Teller collection and said, hey, you know what? I've got some wonderful images as well. I'd love to share them with you and let you share them with the world. So there were many elements of this sort of virtuous cycle um, that Carol and her collection created for us. So in addition to its own incredible wonder, it sort of generated this ongoing um, contribution and engagement from the public about um, the history of New York and people recognizing um, that these uh, personal or family um, recollections and images that they have could actually be historic artifacts that have a, a value um, uh, to the world uh, to be appreciated. So um, thank you, Carol. And, um, I'm going to start by just kind of asking you, in a, in a quick sort of general way, if you could tell us, um, what, what was your process like in terms of, over the course of the 30 or so years that you took these pictures, of taking these, these images? Did you just carry your camera with you where you walked, and if you saw something that was of interest to you, you snapped a picture? Were you out there looking for things? Was it a, a, a variety? I think... Well, first of all, I have to thank you. That was quite an introduction. I don't know who that was, but thank you. Uh, I think over a course of so many years, there were different motivations at different times. Sometimes I walked around specifically to take pictures because my neighborhood is, uh, I come from Brooklyn, very simple and very predictable. And coming to the East Village as a young person, I was 22 or 21, that was, the, I couldn't ask for more in life. And there was nothing better than to go around and shooting pictures. And people at that time didn't mind. You can take pictures of people and they wouldn't ask you why. So, uh, and also I shot in black and white, so that makes everything look good. So that helped. Uh, 
I love how modest Carol is, no, by no, the way. No, 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 it's all very true, though. Everybody knows that. <laughs> well, and by the way, while you're talking, Carol, I was just sort of scrolling back and forth between one or two of your paintings that, and as folks will see, are uh, often very similar to or based on some of her photographs. So obviously there's an interaction. How often when you took a picture were you thinking about, I might paint this later, and how often were you just taking the picture for the sake of taking the picture? In the early days, I took pictures for the sake of pictures. Now I take pictures, I have a whole collection of, of photographs that if I live long enough, I'll paint them. But, uh, so here, by the way, is uh, the, the view from your apartment. I have this most fantastic view, and because it's tenements and the land wasn't good for building high rise on, I have a, a scope of uptown views. And tell everybody what you refer to that uh, that view on the left as. Oh, uh, the Trinity. You see, oh, the Trinity. Before they, they did what they're doing now, I had the MetLife, the Empire State, and the Equitable Life, and it made a beautiful Trinity. And now, of course, there's no more MetLife in my view. I have some box. Yeah, there's there's some uh, some other stuff there now. So let's uh, let's take a little bit of a deep dive. Oh, and okay. just so I don't forget. By the way, one of the many ways in which you can explore our historic image archive, Carol's photos and other photos, is uh, via map, um, as well as by collection, by image. And you'll see on the uh, uh, flyer that we have out there, um, prints of Carol's and most of the other images in our archive are available for sale benefiting GBSHP. So um, if you're interested, feel free to uh, take a look, um, and at any time, uh, you can order. So Carol, I am going to just kind of go through some of these amazing pictures with you and ask you to tell us a little bit about them. So here's the first one, which is the Elizabeth Street Garden with Mr. Purple. Okay, he's a perfect example of why, as a young person, it was just wonderful living in the East Village. This was a character. The fact that the villager has worked up a whole story about how terrible a man he was has nothing to do with the fact that he was a wonderful, wonderful character and elicited all kinds of romantic notions about life in the East Village and, and what you could do and uh, anything was possible. And so how much did you know about him when you snapped this photo? Was this, he someone you saw around and had a sense of who I he was? I never knew him. Uh -huh. I just saw he would ride a bike with purple things hanging. Everybody who's from New York knows. He was just a wonderful character. It's what made street life exciting. It's street theater that makes it so valuable. Sure. Uh, and certainly it's a lot of characters like that that we see in your pictures. Um, one of the themes, certainly in your pictures, um, are these uh, fading street wall signs, uh, which you were very fond of. Uh, this one is, of course, no longer built, uh, visible because a building's been built in front of it. Um, just out of curiosity, anything in particular that tended to draw you to these faded street signs, faded wall signs? I had a friend many years ago who taught me about street signs. I had, coming from Brooklyn, I never really knew about them or noticed them, but they represented a whole way of life and a way people learned about things. And it was, I guess, early advertising. It worked beautifully. You can't miss them. Yeah, well, that is true, and a lot of them were in fact, um, uh, even at this point, fading, and of course would only fade more over the years. But um, and in some cases, a few of them are still there, which is kind of amazing. Um, so here, there's, you definitely have sort of a whole series, even if they weren't planned that way, of uh, downtown in the early 1960s. And they're just these amazingly beautiful um, images of the, the old, um, Lower Manhattan skyline and the old South Street Seaport of Brooklyn Bridge when they were in uh, a shape nothing like what they are today. Um, what, what made you kind of stop at this corner and take this picture? I have no idea, but... I, <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's not what you idea. told me on Tuesday. <laughs> but the whole idea of shooting at the seaport was it was this lovely, quiet, sort of derelict, almost uh, could be sinister, but again, again, it wasn't sinister. It was just evocative of what might have been. And uh, at that time, there were a lot of places around New York that you could find that feeling. Now, uh, I just heard on the news about uh, Long Island City's completely gone. Red Hook's gone. Uh, I don't know if there's anything left. 
But at that time, this was still there to have that kind of mystery about it. And just notice how incredibly beautifully framed this is and with the sort of uh, the fog and shrouded skyline behind these sort of beautiful, decrepit uh, buildings in the foreground. Um, that really, I think, says a lot about your eye, Carol, and your ability to um, frame a picture. But speaking of that picture, I, sometime if there's some real photographer here who knows about uh, film and, and all that, if they could tell me what I shot that with to get that look, if it was Tri-X or, or what did it? <laughs> well, you know, Carol sometimes likes to say, well, it's just because black and white photos look, uh, you know, so beautiful, but you actually have quite a few color photos in here as well that are also incredibly evocative. Um, you know, this is such a picture of sort of like the vibrant Lower East Side Street in the 1960s, um, uh, and you take a lot uh, on and around Orchard Street, which I imagine you were traveling along quite a bit. Oh, it's a favorite place. Yeah. Um, for shopping, for picture taking, both? I don't shop, but for picture taking. Uh, <laughs> now, this, this picture strikes me. I'm a lifelong New Yorker, um, but obviously my memory only goes back so far. Um, and certainly, uh, I remember a, a much grittier, more uh, broken down New York, but I never saw the Brooklyn Bridge with piles of rubble underneath it like this, which uh, you captured this and many other similarly desolate images of uh, what we now think of as you know, the financial district, um, the South Street Seaport area, um, that certainly had a dramatically different character at this time. Well, that ramps. Yes, yes, that's a good point, without some of those FDR ramps running overhead. So you were drawn to this area because it had this sort of like semi- It's part of the seaport mm -hmm. area, right. Yeah, and would you walk there from home or what would you be doing uh, down in that part of town? No, knowing me, I would drive. Uh-huh. <laughs> Fair enough. So, all right. Let's continue along here. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about, you had a sort of special relationship to uh, Colonnade Road. Oh, I imagine everyone here knows the history and how elegant and unbelievably uh, it was a high society road. Well, when it became not so high society in the 60s, I had a friend who moved into an apartment there and that had absolutely magnificent detail work. It was all there. The only trouble was that uh, the taste of the people moving in didn't equal what was there already. So you get uh, a hippie look combined. It was sort of like the... Uh, the natives take over the, the palace or something like that. <laughs> Well, you definitely, we only have a couple. So uh, in many cases, because Carol gave us such a wealth of pictures for this sort of first batch, we had to kind of pick and choose. So this is, I think we have one, maybe two of the Colonnade Row, but you have, and we'll be releasing all of them, these incredible images of the inside, right. architectural detail. It was that apartment with, the, with their stuff. It's, it's just in incredible. In front of all the beautiful details. Incredible to see, yeah. Um, all right, let's keep going through here. Here's a is one of your favorite signs, which actually, interestingly, another one of the people who later uh, donated some images to us um, to, had a picture of this exact same sign. So I think it, it, and believe it or not, you can still see it. It's, it's very faded, but it's still there. Uh, 60 Grand Street, uh, just off of West Broadway. Um, and uh, um, anything in particular about this one that you recall or that caught your eye? It was the palimpsest. It was one over another. Really intriguing. Uh, well, it's also lovely the way the water tower kind of sits off to the side um, over it. It really is evocative of a, sort of an old New York. So this one, I have a little bit of a, a story to, to tell. Um, we uh, heard from, and there's actually a few cases like this. So uh, we heard from somebody who said that the gentleman, I believe in the glasses, was his grandfather and that this was the only known photograph of his grandfather. Um, and that because this collection had been shared so far and wide and was so uh, popular, he just happened upon it. Um, and he reached out to us to say, you know, where did this come from? How did you get this picture? And we told him the story, he, pr he purchased the print, um, uh, and uh, he was just so happy to see that his grandfather was no longer with us that he actually now had a, a photographic uh, 
uh, evidence of him. Um, we believe this is on Canal Street, next to 210 Canal Street. You can see the little number 210 uh, next to the guy's nose there, uh, but we're not absolutely sure. We've tried to line it up with existing buildings, and a lot of it looks right, but a couple of details don't look right, so we're not 100% sure. But it's a great picture, just kind of showing you um, sort of a street scene from New York. Do you, do you have any, do you remember taking that picture? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, here's another great one, which, Again, we have about a dozen of these, but we only put uh, one or two in this collection of what were the bocce courts on the corner of First Avenue and First Street. Um, and the uh, old gentleman playing bocce there, this would have been probably about 1963, 64. You had quite a few pictures of this. This was a favorite of yours. Yeah, because this was the last remaining remnant of the Italian, the old fashioned Italian population, because my neighborhood was divided up. Each street had a different ethnic background. The Ukrainians were on one street, the Italians were another, and eventually it all got mixed up and people moved in. But this was a, a remnant of the real, true Italians, so I, I enjoyed taking pictures. And they, then, were, they were very nice. They show the, you how to do it, how to roll the ball. And of course that park is still there, but the bocce court is not. It has a very different uh, look now, but it, it, it's just such a great... Uh, and uh, so for you, when you were looking at this, you thought, oh, this is a wonderful piece of this kind of like Italian slice of life of my neighborhood. Um, were you conscious of the fact that maybe a few years from now you might not be able to take a picture of this anymore, that it might no longer be here? Uh, I don't know if I really was about this, because mm -hmm. I thought they had a good stronghold. Mm -hmm. But a lot of other pictures, yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's amazing how many things you took pictures of that are so... Um, so powerful and evocative, but are, are no longer with us. Um, you uh, Obviously, in some cases, you saw buildings that were in the process of being demolished and said, you know, let me take a picture of this before I... Yeah, I like uh, that one. You know, yeah. while I still can. Here's a, a couple of that I, I'm sort of struck by. So, you know, I was a, a, a teenager in the 1980s, so this, you know, kind of brings me back to my youth. And so to me, um, this reminds me of the sort of the New York of the early 1980s um, in a lot of ways, a, a scene that I feel like you wouldn't, see on the streets um, so much anymore. And you, you have a lot of these of just sort of people you didn't know but who were doing something on the street that you thought was worthy of capturing on film. Yeah, and it sort of reminded me when I was that age mm -hmm. that I would go out and do something. Paint on the street? Paint on the street. Or we used to go around doing rubbings of uh, the uh, sewer covers. <laughs> so um, this next picture along those lines possible that uh, some of you have seen this because it's actually made the rounds since we released it. Um, this past year was the 50th anniversary of the, um, the Cube, as it's sometimes called. Its official name was the Alamo. Um, and a lot of different media outlets picked up on this image to use as a sort of emblem of um, the many years that have gone by since this um, has first been uh, installed. Um, and uh, I also find this really evocative, and I love the way that the sculpture, which I know you're not personally a big fan of, uh, plays off against the, um, uh, the mural uh, on the wall behind it, which, of course, this part of town used to have tons of those. And was that part of what, what kind of... Yeah, it was, of it was really the, the, the design of the thing, to have that cube thing with the zigzags. Mm -hmm. But the, the way the people are in front of it, I think if it was the cube and, the, and just the cube and the zig zigzags, it would be a little flat, but the way you have those... You're right, I didn't even realize people, that, you're right. That, but you, I think you intuitively were able to um, capture that. So, let's see. Here's a lovely picture of what was once a very common occurrence in Washington Square. I'm sure a lot of folks here can remember this. Um, and a lot of your pictures are of parks, Washington Square, Tompkins Square. Um, would you frequently go through there with your camera and kind of just... That was, yeah, that was a good place to capture people rather than things. Yeah. Um, I assume these were not people that you knew. They just no. were up to something that looked sort of interesting. No, I was usually... I like being the fly on the wall kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so here... Year. This one has also gotten a lot of reaction. Um, apparently there's a lot of folks here that were, a, a lot of folks out there who were a big fan of this guy, Rene, who was this um, artist who had um, his stuff up 
all coming and going all over uh, Lower Manhattan at the time. It's a really striking image, especially with those uh, cobblestones in front of it. Um, and this building, by the way, is still there. The mural is not. The Food Trade Corporation of America sign is not. Um, it's now very, you know, it's very Soho now. It's very sleek and done up. Um, uh, did, was this somebody who you kind of followed, or what, what drew you to this to take a picture? No, I have no idea who the name was, but it was such a good picture. Yeah, and uh, was it just kind of that um, over time you started to do pictures in color more, or I'm just curious what might have uh, uh, impacted your choice of color versus black and white? I mean, this seems made for color in so many ways. I, I think, um, I really don't know. I think it was just at a certain time towards the That's end. The early ones were all black 70s. and white. In the 70s, is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. My car, is it the 70s car? Well, the, the, the car, yeah, the cars maybe, but we were actually able to date this because um, it's known when this mural was up. Um, and so this mural was up for just a couple of years in the uh, early to mid 1980s. So I think there just happened to be some slightly older cars parked in front of it That's at the amazing. time. How if did you look you at the, that out? If, uh, we did a little bit of on-site research, uh, but if you look at the car on the front left, you can tell it's sort of a little newer. Yeah. Um, but these are the kinds of things that we looked at um, to try to date these uh, these pictures. We would do research about the mural. We would look at the cars. We would look at the fashions. We would look at the stores and see if we could kind of like have a, a matrix that would um, identify a, a date. And in one or two cases, um, you'll see there's some further down where there was like a poster uh, that was hanging up on a wall that would help us to uh, identify the date. So here's one of the ones of the interior of Colony Row. So this was your, your friend's apartment. Yeah, but you, it, this is not the picture with all the junk in it. So you have only the pretty part. You cropped the junk out. <laughs> well, then I, I imagine these were very, very high ceilings. Oh, it was magnificent, yeah. yeah. See that? I mean, this looks like it could be like a, a Gilded Age um, uh, early photo. Um, so here, oh, this it's one. It's my favorite. It's a, a favorite of both mine and um, uh, uh, Carol's. Do you want to talk about it? Well, I liked it simply because it, it it just looks so perfectly proportioned, almost Palladian in the way the verticals and the horizontals go. And I had no idea of where it was. It could have been anywhere in the East Village. Now, how would you determine exactly where it is? I couldn't figure it out, but leave it to Andrew to figure out exactly where it was. Well, so this was literally eating away at me for, for months at a time. I knew I knew this. I knew it looked different now, but that, um, uh, you know, because of the nature of the work that I do, uh, things like architectural details stay in my head. And it was, uh, you know, but it was very, very hard to place. Um, Carol says, you know, it could have been anywhere in the East Village. But also, that I, I was thinking for a while, it looks a little bit like Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Um, it, in general, I thought it had this very sort of like Edward Hopper-esque sort of look to it. So uh, one day, I'm sitting in Veselka eating lunch. I turn my head and I look out the window. And I see the storefront, at which now looks nothing like this in the sense that it's brightly painted, but all of the architectural details are the same, and it just, it clicked. It was like, for, for about six months, it was like every moment of my life was a, a, a game of classic concentration, and I was trying to find that match um, to something that I had in my head. So this is uh, 9th Street, just east of um, uh, 2nd Avenue. It's where Mud Coffee now is. Um, and that was, it was, uh, and, uh, anybody who was uh, on staff uh, at the time can testify to this that you know any time we were able to identify one of these that had been gnawing at us for months was you know it was like popping the, the champagne cork. Um, so here these on Grand Street I know you also were very uh, fond of Carol. Aren't they lovely? The little dormers, like three little birds sitting in uh, along the street and now the dormers are gone. And by the way those little dormers tell you that those were individual houses built probably around 1800, 1820, um, that had managed to survive into, I guess, the 1970s, probably. Um, and a lot of them, in just in the last couple of years, um, have been destroyed, unfortunately. That car is 1978. <laughs> so, we have an expert in the house. So it's at least, it's at least the late 1970s. Thank you.
Um, so here's another great picture. So these obviously were three young women who you didn't know, but you just, uh, you liked the way they were sitting there and decided to take that picture. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's also, it's just, it's not a scene that you see so much anymore uh, in the neighborhood, but was, I think, definitely the way people occupied um, public space. Um, you know, a couple of decades ago, but really don't so much anymore. And this is another one. You identified where it was. I had no idea. And don't ask me how we did it, but we were able to figure out exactly which doorway that was. That's amazing. Yeah. This one I don't remember, but I remember when I did figure it out, I, it, was a, it was a hallelujah moment. Um, and by the way, just so everyone knows, it was, it's more than just an obsession we, uh, in terms of identifying these locations. GDSHP has had this years-long uh, project um, that we're hoping to complete and share with the public soon um, called Building Blocks, where uh, we've mapped every single building in the entire East Village. So 14th Street to Houston Street, uh, 4th Avenue to the East River. And we've done research on the history of every single one of these buildings, establishing when it was built, who built it, what it was built for, what it's been used for over the years. And part of that process is putting together, um, whenever possible, images of the building over the years so that we can establish this is when this changed, this is when this was added, et cetera. So knowing that so many of these pictures that Carol took were of the East Village, we wanted to identify the exact location of every one so that when we launched this building blocks site, we'd be able to link each one of these uh, images to the uh, appropriate building so that if somebody wanted to uh, look at what the doorway of 263 um, East 10th Street looked like around the mid-1980s, they could pull up this picture and see. And I'm actually now realizing the number 263 in the upper right-hand corner there was part of the hint. And I'm pretty sure that what I did was, so looking through all of Carol's photos, I started to kind of get a sense of by the way a picture looked, which walk she was on when she took it. And I said, while this could be a few different places, this looks like one of her East Village walks. So what I did was, through Google Street View, I just went 263 East 13th Street, 263 East 12th Street, 263 East 11th Street, until I found one where I said, okay, wait a minute, this could be it. And then zeroed in a little closer. And you can see some of those architectural details like uh, next to the the doorway there that are very, very distinctive. And when you found something, sometimes they're not still there, so it's not as, as easy as that. But that's that's the way that we uh, we went about identifying these. And this is a story of Jersey sociology, too. So there's people probably hanging out on their own stoop. Possibly on their own stoop. I'll say as somebody who was around that age at that time, I was, didn't matter if it was my stoop or not. Um, <laughs> uh, but that, that's a whole other story. Um, so this uh, is another one of your great uh, South Street Seaport pictures. And believe it or not, this building is still there, and that doorway is still there. Um, you, would, you would not have guessed it would live to uh, tell that story. Um, but Carol, do you, uh, do you remember encountering this? I think this is a famous doorway. That's why I took it, yeah. And obviously, the, 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 the lettering tells you exactly where it was. So when I, when I first saw this, I thought, oh, you know, this is one of those buildings that's you know, been lost, and you know, what a shame. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's so wonderful that we captured it on film, and then I looked, and believe it or not, it is, it is still there. Um, uh, it's it's, oh, it's in a lot better shape now than it was in this picture, uh, for sure. Um, it's amazing how many of these uh, seaport um, buildings that Carol uh, took pictures of are actually still there um, and have since been restored. So Carol, you were telling me you had sort of your own kind of personal connection to this store, right? Uh, well, it's one of those stores that in the East Village you had useful things like upholstery, uh, uh, cobblers, uh, shoemakers. You didn't have restaurants. If you wanted to eat in a fancy restaurant, you went uptown. Uh, and now, of course, the world has changed. And so this is uh, Essex Street, just it's south a of, of Houston. Yeah. And just to the right, at oh, the time. Yeah, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jasper. Jasper Johns, right. That was his studio. So that, that old bank building, which I believe is in the process of being demolished right now. So, is it really? Yeah. Um, but that was, uh, for a long time it was a club called The Bank, but prior to that it was Jasper Johns' uh, studio, uh, 
Um, and you, you were aware of that at the time, right? Yeah, it was famous for that. And it was all beautifully proportioned building, really mm -hmm. elegant. Yeah. And Jasper Johns was here, and uh, three blocks away was Rauschenberg. Mm -hmm. so. That's right. And you, you have some pictures of uh, his studio we as well. Do you have that in this batch? Uh, yes, that was in this batch. Um, Veselka, you took some wonderful pictures of Veselka over the years. N not too far, but not on that block. Oh, okay. Yeah, but a similar storefront sign. Um, so uh, you took some great pictures of Veselka over the years. I know we've got a few more of them uh, in here, some of them in uh, process. Uh, let's see. This is a lovely picture of what I would say is a sort of classic Lower East Side uh, window. Um, anything in particular that kind of drew you to that? Well, it was the combination of the uh Obviously, somebody with that, with not too much money, growing his plants, and what was really happening in the neighborhood. You had the, the pest control downstairs. <laughs> That's great. But uh, I think you identify this this window too. I mean, how do you identify a window? Uh, so this one, you see how it says uh, 124. So you say habla español 124. So there again, I figured, all right, it's probably 124 East something in the East Village and went street by street until I could find a building. And there's some very distinctive architectural detail there, so we are able to um, match it up. And eventually it's gonna be connected to the building history that we have um, for that building. This fantastic sleuthing work. Uh, well, it was a lot of fun. Um, and so here we have, you know, this one, uh, you know, kind of pulls at my heart a little bit. So this was the old Love Saves the Day. Um, and of course this building and the buildings next to it were destroyed in the um, gas explosion. Um, this is the corner of 7th Street and 2nd Avenue. Obviously none of which you could have known at the time, but all the more reason why you're capturing this was so poignant. And you managed to um, get the little um, old uh, street sign um, up on the building that says 7th Street um, in the picture. It's really a beautiful image. We're, and you told me Love Saves the Day, you, you knew it, but it's not some place you would have ever shopped or... No, or I, I like just that. like the name. You just like the name. Who could, who could not like a name like that? <laughs> uh, and that store, I, I know, was uh, opened in 1966 and I think closed 40-something years later. So definitely one of the kind of old um, standards of the uh, East Village. Um, here's a lovely one. Many layers of signage. And, um, you know, it's funny. There's a couple of things in here that give you hints that this picture was taken, that it is uh, no older than the 1970s, but there's a lot of things about this that are so kind of timeless that it could be, it could be much older, it could be much newer, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, these buildings are not, uh, are not here anymore. This is uh, along Delancey Street, just uh, uh, west of Essex Street. Is that right? That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, and with this, uh, a lot of your pictures kind of cover this territory. This was an area you were in pretty frequently. Uh, it was a good place to wander down to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and the, do you think the old Baby Ruth sign was kind of That's part of it? That's what I liked. Yeah. <laughs> and the Beckenstein. Yeah. So here's a couple of other um, just amazing sort of little storefronts that you captured. Um, this one's also become very popular on the internet. We've seen it picked up and used uh, quite a few places. Um, and I, off the top of my head, I can't remember how it is that we identified exactly where it is, but this is 56 Great Jones Street on the north side uh, between Bowery and Lafayette Street. And Tell me when you saw something like this, what, what attracted you to it? Well, this was the period when you did have random graffiti and some of it was really good. I thought that was nice. Uh, I like, I just liked it as a painting. Well, there is a sort of a certain uh, randomness, but beauty to it as well. Um, here's another, Carol and I were talking about this the other day. This one was a lot of fun to um, identify the location. I was immediately just struck by this image because it's such a, it just says different era in New York in every way uh, possible but I never thought I would be able to uh, figure out where it was, and we'll get into that in a second, but tell me at the time, because this was a not uncommon kind of storefront um, back when you took this picture, what, what do you think spoke to you about it? 
Uh, it was a combination of the signs, a seal test sign, a coke sign, I mean, that's just uh, classic, and the texture. It, it was a beautiful pattern of the gates with the uh, tile and the way, just the whole composition of the texture and the designs that made a, a really good picture. If you turn it upside down, it holds up too. Yeah. Well, I, I also think capturing the woman sort of passing through it um, definitely adds it some gives it texture, gives it the little bit of movement right. um, that it needs. So in this case, we were able to identify it being on Second Avenue because even though there's nothing here virtually that um, exists anymore, if you look over here on the left-hand side, if you look closely, there's this very strange open space here. Um, and you can see in the background what appears to be a sort of high-rise post-war building with balconies. Um, and uh, when I saw that, I thought, maybe that's Village View Houses. Maybe that's where Carol lives, and you're looking um, uh, east towards it, which would make it Second Avenue. Um, and you know, that complex extends for three or four blocks, so there's a couple of places where that could have been, and we did in fact find a building that has a space between it and the other building where you can see Village View Houses. And we were able to look at the pattern that you can just barely see of the windows above where it says Fountain Service, um, and it lined up. Things like that don't change over time if the building is still there. So we were able to, through that, definitively uh, identify that this was a 50, 52nd, uh, Second Avenue, um, which was definitely a lot, of, uh, a lot of work, but a lot of fun. Um, this one here, so we have a great partnership with an app called Urban Archive um, that um, shares our, our, uh, our online historic archive as well as that of many different institutions, the Museum of the City of New York, the New York Public Library, Brooklyn Historical Society with the World. Um, they decided uh, that they wanted to do a, a treasure hunt based on Carol Teller's uh, collection that we put on our website. And the image that they decided to use um, for the, um, the treasure hunt was this. Um, I think because this, looking at this, it would be so hard to figure out where is this. It seems almost as if like it's out of the Wizard of Oz, the, the proverbial house that just kind of dropped out of the sky uh, somewhere, and you can't really see it in this image. And I never would have been able to figure out where it was, except Carol had another image that's a little bit broader. And you can see that this is just west of Second Avenue on St. Mark's Place when there used to be this bank of telephone booths with this sort of fake wood um, uh, um, uh, siding uh, next to it. Um, and this is a sort of a really striking image as well. So the uh, gem spot is just to the left of this. And this is, I assume, the early 1980s. I know this is a favorite one of yours, Carol. Do you want to say something about this? So this is one of Carol, at least in this collection, this is one of the newest ones. It's dated on the lower uh, right-hand side. You can see it's from 1991. Um, it's all gone now. It's all glass and uh, steel. But I think that but was you, really you didn't a good know painting. That. You didn't know that at the time, that this was not long for this world. No, I didn't, but uh, I guess I should have. I mean, <laughs> um, but it, it just, um, it's delightfully slummy. <laughs> it's a great way of uh, describing it. So let's take a look at a couple more. Oh, so this one was a lot of fun. Um, I learned something I from this here. I, I, didn't, I didn't know this story either. Um, Carol just had this wonderful picture of a um, hair cutting salon on uh, St. Mark's Place. Actually, we didn't know originally that it was St. Mark's Place, but we were able to kind of figure that out. And then uh, it had the name on there, Paul McGregor. Did a little bit of on -site, uh, online research and discovered this was the place where the shag haircut was invented and um, was the inspiration for the movie Shampoo. Who knew? Um, and Carol had the uh, eye and foresight to uh, capture it on film. So we've got, an, uh, uh, so we've got a nice little record of it here. Um, what do you, now, Carol, you told me that you were also unaware of this. So you just took this picture because there was something about this visually that struck you. Yeah, I, I really don't know exactly what was going on that made me take it, but I didn't know anything about the hair cutting thing. Maybe, Maybe it was, was the dog. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, we have a couple of your Penn Station pictures. So um, you were obviously aware at the time that Penn Station was in the process of being 
uh, demolished. Yeah, I mean, I knew it, would, it was coming down and I should take pictures, mm -hmm. but I didn't take enough. Well, you, you definitely captured some unusual ones of the building in the process of being uh, dismantled. Um, we have one later on where you can kind of actually sort of see through the building because uh, the interior has already been demolished and you can just see those sort of columns standing there. So they're, they really are this kind of striking record. You know, typically the, the pictures of Penn Station are either of it before it was being demolished when people were fighting to save it or the, the rubble. Um, I feel like there's something particularly striking about seeing what clearly is this monumental building in this state of just being boarded up and waiting to be um, knocked down. Um, uh, there's something particularly poignant, uh, I think, about that. The grime on the building. The grime, the, exactly, the state of disrepair and neglect um, that it was in at that point. But not grime on the sculptures. Maybe the way that's the way. But they were uh, yeah, and it may be because they were a little sort of farther off the ground or something like that. They managed to stay a little bit uh, 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 in better shape for a while. Um, let's, uh, well, so here's this wonderful image from um, Carol's, uh, uh, is this from your window or your balcony, Carol? Balcony. Yeah, well, you can imagine if this is what you got to look out at every day, you'd be inspired as well. Um, and you really captured this uh, quite beautifully. Now, we showed that uh, painting. Do you, do you have a lot of different paintings of this, this holy trinity, as you call it, or uh, is it just that, that, that one that captured it? A few, you? but not too many, mm -hmm. just because uh, then I go down to the street level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's sort of great. Uh, you, obviously, you can't see it in this picture, but um, from up there, you can see these um, uh, you can get a wonderful sense of what the tenements of the East Village look like from this vantage point of kind of almost floating uh, above them. Here's one of my favorites that I'm gonna share. Um, and this, Carol and I have had a fun back and forth about this over the years. So I love this picture. Um, you can see the old St. Mark's Theater there and you can see that the movie Taxi Driver um, was playing at the time. What I was struck by when I first saw this was, so this guy who has his back to the camera with the, um, uh, with the jacket on, looks very, very similar to the image in the taxi driver photo of Robert De Niro as Travis Bickle. Um, Carol tells me she had no idea of that. She just happened to snap the picture at this time and this guy happened to be in the frame. Um, but what I love is that intentionally or not, it seems to be this almost sort of meta representation of taxi driver, except it's actually playing in the theater. Because if, if, if you recall in that image, he's walking down a street with a movie marquee over his head, obviously not paying taxi driver, playing taxi driver. I think there's like a, a porn film or something like that, you know, sort of representative of the, of the decay. Um, and you can see just in the corner of the picture, do you see this piano in the middle of the street? And you, you can see it's attached to something. You'll, you'll see a, a later picture. Um, that we also have in the collection, but again, capturing these moments on the street that are just priceless, um, and that uh, is not what you see um, in New York much anymore. And we'll, we'll get to that one a, a little bit further down. Here's a great one. This is uh, Ray's Candy Store, when it was uh, Ramon's Candy. Um, and uh, Ray's Candy Store was uh, established in 1974, um, looking at this picture, I'm guessing this is not too many years after it's open. Um, this gentleman in the second row might be able to help us with the, the cars there. That's a 79, 78, 79, okay. so, so it had been there for at least a couple years at this point, but obviously this is the very early days of Ray's Candy Store before it became quite the legend uh, that it is today. And Carol, you, you've always been sort of aware of Ray's, but it's it's not, it's not your hangout spot. It was just thing. another candy store that I don't like the signs. Um, speaking of signs, and that's another thing that you're really great at capturing on film, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about this? Well, I wonder if anybody else remembers Jack's. It was um, it, it's sort of like Russ and Daughters, but not as, as fixed up and neat. Uh, it was real, it was very real. And uh, it was just a, the way appetizing stores should be, and they had chocolate covered halva with nuts. And does everybody uh, recognize what you can see just in the right hand side of the frame there? That's the, that's the Fillmore East before it was demolished. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
and of course that wonderful, but you know, not, not all is lost. Not only are all the other buildings in the frame um, still there, but Block Drugs and that wonderful sign is of course still there as well. So you know, we can be thankful for uh, the continuity when it exists. Here's another uh, great theme in Carol's uh, pictures, the Hare Krishnas. So you captured uh, quite a few images. Well, they uh, were all Krishnas. over. I mean, they were, they were really a force of the East Village. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's more seated. The main leader guru is right there in the mm -hmm. in the middle. Square, That's right. I forget exactly what his name is, but that's him. Yeah. And the Tompkins Square is where the Hare Krishna movement was founded. It was under a tree in Tompkins Square Park in 1966. Um, it's often referred to as the Hare Krishna tree. Um, but so they were they were born in this neighborhood, and then of course the um, headquarters was here for uh, many years. Um, so. This, um, this picture I also love. These buildings are still here, um, but they don't look quite as beautiful as this. And here's a, just another wonderful example of how, whether it's uh, color or black and white, Carol's uh, pictures are so uh, resonant. But um, you were telling me a little bit about what uh, kind of drew your eye to this at the time. Well, it's the old Lower East Side look. Um, it's an elegant house. You know it was really nice at one time, but Downstairs, they have remnants and cloth and the practical things of uh, Lower East Side life. Yeah, the sign says woolen and rayon remnants. <laughs> it almost seems as though it's trying to get you to not buy it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whoever their marketer was, uh, they should. Uh, so, uh, you know, speaking of the Lower East Side that's no longer with us, this was a, sort of a particularly uh, poignant photo. Now, when Carol gave this to us, so this is the um, synagogue on Norfolk Street that uh, several months ago suffered that um, devastating fire and just a, a piece of the shell of it remains. But when she gave it to us, it was still there. And here's the interesting thing. Everything else on that block, all of these other buildings around it, just after Carol took this picture in the late 1960s were demolished to make way for the Seward Park urban renewal, but there was a big fight at the time over keeping that synagogue. So everything around it, all those buildings that you see left and right were demolished, but the synagogue survived. And then sadly, just a few months ago, this um, uh, devastating fire, almost none of this building is uh, yet still there. Um, but fortunately, Carol captured it on film. And at the time of the fire, we um, uh, shared that image with people um, who were, um, I think, very struck by um, the image of it. Uh, so this was, this was sort of a nice one. So this picture of the arch back when there was this uh, art installation when it was wrapped in cloth. Um, and I remember you and I had this uh, little bit of a back and forth. It looks like it's a, a, a Jean-Claude and Christo um, artwork, and I wouldn't have known one way or the other, but we did look it up, and it was a different guy named uh, Francis Hines, who I've never heard of, but um, he was big enough to get permission from the city to wrap the arch in, uh, in cloth, so somebody must have liked him somewhere. Uh, let's... Uh, we're gonna take a few others and then uh, we're gonna open it up to the floor for questions. This is an amazing uh, picture. Um, this is, so believe it or not, this is more or less exactly where the South Street Seaport is on the East River waterfront. So where the big ship is now parked and where sort of the entrance is to all of the shops along the waterfront. This is what it looked like in 1963 when Carol was walking through here and saw these two um, young boys and this uh, homeless man, and uh, you, you told me you have a vague recollection of this, right? Uh, yeah, uh, I just remember that it was just poignant, the, the kids, um, and it's the kind of shot I would never try to take now. I wouldn't go near, I wouldn't uh, approach people that way. People were living in boxes on the street, yeah. sure, um, but it was a, and I would imagine it was a less common sight then as well. Uh, I guess so, yeah. Uh, you can see. When you were here, did you, looking the other direction, did you see any uh, construction for the foundation of the World Trade Center at that time? This would have been long before the World Trade no, Center. I think, I think this, 
It's the other side of town. This is the, yeah. this is this is the, the East River waterfront. This is the East River. Yeah. Well, I took a lot of pictures in 67 from that area of where the South Street Seaport. Right. Yeah. And from there, I could see where they were laying the foundation for the World Trade. World Trade. I don't remember it. Carol did just uh, recently donate to us a wonderful picture of the World Trade Center under construction, uh, which we're looking forward to uh, sharing with the world. Um, here is a nice picture where you captured uh, a couple of different institutions that were um, not going to be with us for much uh, longer. Um, the um, the um, uh, the theater, which event, which was soon after this picture was taken, became the Fillmore East. Which was then known as the uh, the village, uh, the uh, yeah I think it was called the village theater, um, and Rappaport's, which was right next to it. Um, but I think you were focusing on these three sort of old, uh, probably Eastern European uh, women who were kind of gathered on the street when you took this picture. Is that right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, but it's great that you caught that stuff in the background. Just do one or two more, and then we can open it up to questions. And by the way, so you know, we're really just skimming the surface of these pictures. I think we're maybe getting halfway through the collection. So if you haven't already, do go online, check it out. Um, so this was just some random woman sitting on the street with a parrot, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah, another character that made East Village life exciting. Yeah. And would you generally say something to the person? No. No, you just snap the picture and run? That's great. All right, let me just... Uh, Carol, you, I'm going to sort of scroll through. You tell me if there's anyone that you think it's... Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell this story because this one's amazing. So like that other one uh, with the guy on Canal Street, uh, a woman... You see this picture here? So this is the corner of West Broadway and I believe Broom Street. Um, and you can see the sort of state that this uh, Soho building was in, which of course many of these buildings were at the time. Of course, there's now some incredibly she-she store. And you can just see the side of the, uh, of the mural on the left-hand side that we were looking at before. But do you see this woman um, over here in the background? Um, she's leaning against the building. I don't know if you can sort of see, but there's all this kind of stuff scattered on the um, steps there. So this is a woman who used to sell handmade um, uh, children's clothes on the street in Soho. Her daughter saw this picture um, shared on one of these websites somewhere and contacted us and said, that's my mother. Um, and she told us the story of how she uh, um, and her mother you know, lived in what was probably a not that uncommon kind of existence then that you could in downtown Manhattan, but never could today, where she was sort of you know, making these handmade articles and selling them on the street, and that's um, how they uh, lived. And you know, again, it was a case, this wasn't the only known picture of her mother, um, but uh, she didn't, uh, I believe, have any pictures of her um, uh, uh, selling her products on the street, and she really loved finding this. And that was just a, an amazing, amazing coincidence. Just one of the many ways in which your pictures have touched uh, a lot of people. When you, with something like this, what, what were you looking at? What do you think was catching your eye? I think probably the dilapidated doorway. Mm -hmm. It is really striking. It's hard to sort of think of today an, an empty, dilapidated storefront in Soho. <laughs> not, not a lot of those left, but of course that was the... That was the uh, rule, not the exception, um, at this time. Um, and then here's this great picture of Washington Square Arch in what was a, a typical state for the arch um, in the not that distant past. I mean, you know, into the 90s, the arch was uh, commonly covered in graffiti, um, but you would never, uh, uh, you would never guess that now. So anyway, let me just uh, sort of. Carol, if there's any here that you since want to, us to um, hit on before we open it up to the floor for questions. Carol had a lot of pictures of S. Kleins. It was a great their, sight. Yeah, in various states of uh, demolition. It took so long. <laughs> I love this guy here sitting uh, on the couch on the street. But you don't the see it. And then this one in uh, Brooklyn, President Nixon, now more than ever. 
and that guy on the on, in the couch. Now they'd worry about bed bugs. I think, and nobody would care. Now, let me actually ask uh, folks this because so Carol. Oh, and by the way, before I get to that, so this is one of the other ones. Whoops. Uh, so here you can see Penn Station is half demolished already um, at this point. And so it's just, it's such a striking image. It's now just um, a shell, the outermost parts waiting to be um, uh, demolished, which um, fortunately for all of us, Carol at least was able to capture on film. Um, so this one here is another one that's kept me up at night for the last year or so. And funnily enough, Carol and I both think it's the same place but I have looked at historic photos that seem to indicate that it is not. So this looks incredibly familiar to me, and I was sure that this was the east side of the Bowery, um, just north of Houston or First Street, um, which you know now has been totally transformed with those big new buildings. But I've looked at historic photos um, and the buildings that were there previously. I don't have like a great picture from this exact same angle um, do not appear to line up with what we're seeing here. Um, there's a few clues, none of which have been able to get us to the location. One is this faded Tetley's T sign. Another is this sign here for something that seems to be, um, yeah, real estate and fire shoes, but the name is K-E-I-B-E, -E. so it's like, Kaisberger or something like that. And then this is the most mysterious thing. Over here, there's this um, thing sticking up on what is clearly a, a post-war, probably 1960s, 1970s building. It looks like it's a, um, a ventilation shaft, a chimney, something like that. So somewhere in the not too great distance is this sort of high-rise 60s or 70s building, which I thought maybe was the, the Jasa Senior Building on Bowery and Fifth but I've looked at it as well and it doesn't line up. So if anybody has any ideas, we've put this on our website, we've put this on our Facebook page, uh, we've shared it by Twitter for anybody who can identify exactly where it is, but Carol and I are, have both been sort of banging our heads against the wall. What it looks to me like is it's actually a, a tire rim that's caught in a tree. <laughs> um, um, but you, you gotta look at every one of those things and see. You know, I thought that maybe we could get a close up on this little sign here and it might be able to tell us something, but it's like a sort of, uh, you can see it in a little greater detail up close, but it just says something like no parking and you know, what have you. So um, this one I think is gonna, is gonna uh, follow me to my grave. <laughs> Bill, can you, Bill rescued me identifying a street one time. Give this some work. <laughs> yeah, if, anybody, if anybody can figure this out for us, we will be eternally, eternally in your debt. Um, let's see, we got the Bread and Puppet Theater per, uh, Parade, um, which Carol, you told me you were a big fan of. Um, oh, they had wonderful puppets, yeah. It's great for school teachers, too, because then you can have the kids make them. Then we got pageant bookstore. Um, it's a lovely picture of that. Um, quite a few pictures of Orchard Street. Um, this is a great one. Sadly, believe it or not, this building, which was once the second tallest building in New York, 260 feet tall, built in 1875, was demolished. Um, it's now Pace University, just south of the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and my guess is, Carol, you were aware that it was being demolished because there's scaffolding up around it and it looks like it's empty in the base. Um, and it was the last of Newspaper Row. Newspaper Row, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and Richard Morris Hunt, so one of the great 19th century uh, American architects, but uh, sadly that was not enough to... That, that to one, that. can you stop it, Newt? Sure. Okay, now this one mystified me. I had it, but I didn't know where I had it from except that I would drive every day to Brooklyn to go to work down Lee Avenue. But it took Andrew to figure out where exactly this sign was. Well, it wasn't, it's not quite as hard as you would think. If you do a close up, and I'm not sure if, yeah, you can see it says 285 Lee Avenue. So this is not 285 Lee Avenue, but 285 Lee Avenue, we figured out was not that far from the sign. So just, you know, with the miracle of Google Street View today, we started searching around that area, and it was actually just a block or so away from the address that 
uh, is, um, uh, is on that side. So we were able to help Carol solve that mystery. Uh, but it's a great, 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 um, great old sign. Uh, the sign is not still there. No. Yeah. Uh, so this one I also uh, love. I'm sure for those of you who were in New York in 1969, you remember Norman Mailer's campaign for mayor on the platform of New York as the 51st state. Um, and Carol, you were just, you were sort of just kind of walking along. And, and yeah, and so he was a celebrity and I kind of wanted to see what he looked like. <laughs> Uh, no, this is a different one. Yeah. Oh, you might be right because the floor shine was next to it. Yeah, it's the same block. Oh, it's a, right. The, right. Uh, I actually think it's a different, um, different, different signage, but probably the same bank. You're right. Right, different time. Yeah. Right. Well, let's see if we have the. Uh... Yeah. So this is the north side of Delancey Street between Orchard and Ludlow. So right. it was it was an earlier picture when they had a different uh, sign up there. Very good call. Thank you very much. Oh, this is that children? one. Yeah, we got okay. to, before you finish sure. up here. Yeah. Okay. Now this is really. A, I've never seen a sign like this, and it, it's not really professional looking. It, it's simple, but apparently there was a whole complex, a church complex. This is where Rauschenberg had his headquarters before Rauschenberg. It was a, a convent and uh, an, uh, an orphanage. And the church went from uh, to Fourth Street. From where? Mm -hmm. Where would it go from? So this is uh, Lafayette, just north of Fourth Street. So yeah. So it's that whole corner where mm -hmm. the parking lot is, and behind the Rauschenberg building, this would be on the Rauschenberg building. And behind it is a little sliver of an old church. Not the whole church, just part of it. And Rauschenberg used that for his studio. And it's it's a great sign, and I love the the tree that's just sort of growing on top of the building there. Um, oh, and so here's the piano guy. So Carol must have snapped this picture uh, a couple of minutes uh, later, just just pulling a piano down the street. Uh, that's what you did on St. Mark's Place in uh, around 1980. Uh, uh, so here is uh, there, you know. I apologize, I keep saying, oh, we're gonna, gonna wrap up, but there's just so many pictures here. Um, this is a, a great picture. And then this one I love, um, which we titled, Man in Fez Holding Cigarettes, Roasting Animals on Spit on Sidewalk. Location unknown. So take a look at this. It is a, a man, it's a man in a fez holding a pack of cigarettes, roasting animals on a spit, on a sidewalk. Um, and we don't know exactly where this is, but presumably it's somewhere in the sort of Lower East Side region. Uh, actually, I thought this was at that Ninth Avenue Festival, the early days of it, but do you think not? I don't know. Could, if anyone can help us definitively identify where this is, or who this guy is, <laughs> uh, we, we, will, um, uh, we will be eternally in your debt. Uh, so here's some more, some more great ones. So this, this was a friend of yours, right, Carol? Uh, this, uh, yeah, this is one of those ironic situations. When I was in school at Pratt, he was a friend of mine. He had an apartment on Avenue A. That was really unusual. And that was my first introduction to the Lower East Side, the romance of it all. And I took a picture of him in front of this building that was coming down, it turns out to be the site of where I live now. This was one of the buildings demolished to make way for Village View Houses, but before Carol lived in Village View Houses or even knew what it would be. Um, so that's a great picture. Um, and then, so who remembers uh, the Lowe's Avenue B Theater? So Carol actually took uh, a, a good uh, dozen-ish uh, pictures of it. Um, we just have one in this collection. We're definitely going to eventually share all of them. But you know, just this wonderful um, snapshot of this building in this state of incredible decay um, before it eventually came down, and sort of showing the arc of life on the Lower East Side. It went from being a vibrant theater to an abandoned theater 
to uh, senior housing to luxury condos. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is Avenue B, uh, west side between, what is it, 5th and 6th? 5th and 6th Street? The structure's not there. Oh, yeah. yeah. And let's just see if there's anything else. Do you want to talk about it? As you go on past Lincoln Squad, or mm -hmm. when I went through this and I said, who's this guy? And I went online, it's amazing what you find out about him and his sister. And yeah. Right. Do you want to say something briefly about Lincoln? Well, I had a studio. There were a bunch of us that shared a storefront for a number of years, right next door on, at 99 East 4th Street, because it was cheap then. And Lincoln was in the store next to us. It was just a very sad story. So someone who was struggling with mental illness. Um, yeah. But his sister was a well-known writer. She right? was a composer, a writer. She worked with, was it the, Elizabeth Swallows, right. With public theater, I think, or La Mama or something. Yeah, but it was just a very sad situation. Right. So, all right, just one or two quick more. Uh, this one, um, I love. You really captured um, the Lower East Side uh, in so many ways, um, and this one here. Um, and it took us a little while to identify exactly where this one was. I actually think somebody uh, tipped us off. I don't know how we managed to miss it, but it's a corner of Stanton and Orchard. Um, and then, of course, uh, as somebody mentioned before, um, we do actually have the pictures of the Hare Krishnas in Tompkins Square with uh, the guru uh, himself. Um, so this was, you know, not long after they were formed in the 1960s. And here they are dancing in the street as well. Um, this picture here has also kind of made the round, so to speak. Um, and I think it's, you know, just sort of a wonderful example of Carol's um, talent at framing a picture um, and capturing a, a moment in time. Um, we actually use this as a sort of a New Year's, uh, best wishes for the New Year's card. Um, uh, on our social media this year, basically saying to people, wherever it is that you're headed in the new year, we wish you um, good luck. Um, and I think it's a, it's a great way of doing that. So there's a lot more. I really want to just encourage everybody to check it out on your own, and we're probably going to do a couple more of these with Carol, um, because there's so much to say uh, and do. Um, but while we still have time, I want to open it up to the floor. Can I just um, say for, something? Yeah, sure. Okay, I just want to say, I, I had these you know, store it away because I'm a pack rat. Um, and I thought I would give them to Andrew and 50 years from now they would be interesting. I had no idea that he would run with it. And because he did, at this age of, at this stage of life, uh, he's given me a, a new identity. So I just, I'm very, very grateful. Incredibly wonderful to work with, and you've uh, helped the organization, and I think helped the cause of uh, historic preservation in New York a tremendous amount. So let's open it to the floor, sir. Yeah, so in anticipation, some weeks ago, I posted this. I, I went online, and two different sessions went through all the ones we had on. And so I enjoy. I know that there are hundreds, but you have like maybe a hundred. So the access to the other ones are. Really so we have them, Carol gave them all to us digitally. So the, this first batch was about 100. The second batch, which we just put up, which we haven't even looked at here tonight, but it's on our website for everyone to look at, is about 100. And we've got about 300 more just from Carol. Um, and there's actually several other people who've donated images to us that we've only just put some of them up so far. Because we don't want to overwhelm the public. We're kind of doling it out and we hope are manageable portions. Um, but uh, people have been incredibly generous to us. And there's much more great stuff uh, to come from that collection. Thank you. 
Oh, and there's somebody in the audience, uh, Colette is here. She, at dinner, she mentioned to me about Vivian Mayer uh, and all her pic uh, photos. I think she was in Chicago, am I right? That was her problem. If she was in New York, <laughs> she could have given them all to Andrew and she would have had a different life. <laughs> Oh, she missed her, she missed her chance. Um, sir? Oh, considering uh, influences, uh, who do you consider as a photographer uh, who may have contributed to your style? You mentioned the Cartier Poussin. Okay, I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a very Carol answer. <laughs> yes, great. struck by some of these images and say, how could these, how could we have let these go? How could we have let these disappear? Um, you know, part of this is to, for the ones that are still here to be able to look at them and to say, wow, this is how they used to look. But the other, for a lot of them, it's to say, you know, why, why, why did we let this happen? So, you know, some of that's explicit and I think some of it's implicit, um, but I, find ourselves in a situation where, for instance, a, a building that we have a great picture of is in is threatened with demolition, but oh, it's like the Broadway, the Broadway building, right? And with the Dukuni, so there, the McDara estate gave us those wonderful pictures of Willem Dukuni in 827 Broadway making this incredible art, and we actually did use that specifically as part of that campaign to help save those buildings. So, yeah, I just want to give folks who haven't asked a question. Uh, Carol, uh, was when you moved. And no, it's because I went to Pratt that I was interested in taking photos. So Pratt sort of encouraged you? Pratt gave me an eye, yeah. Yeah, I'm just curious, in what form do you think that the Oh, I had negatives. And for all these years, to me, they were just useless and that I'd be throwing them away at some point. But because of digitalizing things, I took it, when I looked up how to digitalize, I couldn't do it myself, but they had all these mail order places you could go, you could send things to, but I didn't want to do that. There's one guy on 22nd Street or 5th Avenue, you can walk right up from here, uh, print space. His name is David. He does a wonderful job and he's friendly and nice and you look at the pictures together. Um, what? Right, right, it's right there, yeah. So Carol, you were never doing like the dark room and the painting Oh, I did do that when I was younger, yeah. Yeah. And by the way, if anyone is interested in donating images to us, while it makes life incredibly easy for us if you give them to us digitized, we'll take prints, we'll take negatives, we'll take, uh, you know, anything, if that's something we want to do. Are you only looking for gold? We'll, we'll, we'll look at anything. You know, anything that's about, you know, sort of our neighborhoods, New York, history, architecture, people, culture, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can capture that or celebrate it. Yes? Uh, I'd probably be the last one to try to summarily encapsulate Carol's visual aesthetic, okay? But it does bear a certain connection with a snapshot of aesthetic, which is not in any way to put it down as fact of something that knows it. Okay, if something is t images taken in the moment uh, from the heart and with legitimacy. And in that context, if I could just read this wonderful quote by Lizette O'Dell, who also lived in Greenwich Village, has a lot to say about this aesthetic and by connection also perhaps uh, about Carol. So Lizette O'Dell says, I am a passionate lover of the snapshot because of all photographic images, it comes closest to truth. 
The staff shooter's pictures have an apparent disorder and imperfection, which is exactly their appeal and their style. The picture isn't straight. It isn't done well. It isn't composed. It isn't thought out. That's, that's not to say the counts aren't. And out of this imbalance, and out of this not knowing, and out of this real innocence for the medium, comes an enormous vitality and expression of life. Oh. And that's what she was having. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? Right. Well, thank you to everyone who came. Thank you to Carol for uh, an incredible, incredible body of work. And do um, you know, explore Carol's paintings, although many of you know them already, of photographs and other photographs on our website. And hopefully we can keep this conversation going. Thanks very much.